Welcome back, everyone, and let's move on with our next panel discussion with the theme of challenging the status quo, redefining the new age media planning principle. Let me first introduce you to our moderator, Mr. Rajiv Dhan. He is the Chief Revenue Officer from Z5. And for the panel, first we have Mr. Akash Deep Batra. He is the SVP and Head Marketing BBS Bank. Then we have Mr. Nipun Maria. He is the Director Brand Strategy from Vivo. Next we have Mr. Sujit Ganguly. He is the CMO from ICICI Bank. And we have Ms. Anusha Shetty. She is the Chairman and CEO from Great Group. And finally, we have Ms. Sukhleen Anija. She is the CMO and Marketing Director, Reket Benkaiser. Welcome, everyone. Over to you, Mr. Dhar. <clears throat> Hi, everybody. Uh, good afternoon. Uh, today's topic is an exciting, interesting topic, personal uh, choice for me as well. So I uh, have an esteemed panel with Sukhleen, Anusha, Nipun, Sujit, and Akash. I hope this comes out as a very exciting discussion and it helps each one of us to maybe start revisiting a few areas. What we are going to do uh, is we'll touch upon various aspects of media planning principles that uh, started, uh, that came into emergence around 30 years back, whether things have changed, how are we revisiting, how are we relooking? Uh, we have a very perfect balance in this panel. So we have a representation of, from the largest spending category, which is FMCG CPG. We have representation from an agency perspective. So Anusha represents uh, a, a gray group and she comes from a digital planning background. So she will have a neutral approach. Nipun will give us insights on one of the fastest uh, growing category of handsets. Sujit and Akash will give insights from the category, which is uh, right next to FMCG in terms of spending and has adopted digital uh, way more than any other category. Uh, so, so basically, just to set the perspective, media planning guidelines uh, were, were formulated for TV around 30 years back, as I said, and there used to be a fixed norm on how much reach, how much frequency uh, kind of fundamentals were applied. Uh, I uh, joined Ogilvy Bangalore in 1995, and that's the first time when I was uh, shared the media guideline of HUL and cut to 2020 when you have platforms like Z5, you have Hotstar, you have YouTube, all OTT platforms, which are now mainstream audiovisual channels, and they reach a very valuable and significantly large user base. But if you look at the planning principles, uh, they are being an extension of TV guidelines to a great extent. Uh, let me give an example. So one of the largest instant noodle brand in India decides to target female audience uh, that is between the age groups of 22 to 44 years as their primary target audience. Now, uh, this throws up the first question saying gender bias in targeting, is that appropriate in today's environment? So today's world mobile is becoming an entertainment and commerce hub. Uh, the role of influencer, buyer and consumer is merging into one. The same person, uh, let's take an example, a 20 year old female or a male member at home could be exposed to an instant noodle communication while watching say an OTT platform. They could potentially order a uh, cooked format of noodles from Zomato or Swiggy or raw format from Amazon and Flipkart in the same session. Now, are we really serious that we should only look at women that means housewife, mother, is she going to be responsible for buying or has the world changed around us specifically, specifically for new media that's emerging? So my first question is to Sukhleen. Uh, Sukhleen, in your experience, uh, because you work for and handle one of the largest uh, uh, brands in India, what is your experience? Uh, in, in, in scenario, is there a gender bias? Should that be considered? Share a little more uh, in the media. I think Rajiv, thank you for a wonderful question. I think it, uh, if we, I mean, it's a privilege right now to even be discussing this and actually recognizing the fact how much of the world has changed post the pandemic, right? So, if as for all of you who are aware, Rekid Benkiser is one of the largest household home hygiene companies. 
they have health, hygiene, and nutrition. And within that, I take care of the home and hygiene part of the business. Where if I focus squarely on cleaning, right, which used to be in the past considered to be a domain of women, but today, post the pandemic, in all honesty, if we look around ourselves, we would notice that the gender divide is actually broken, where everyone is actually contributing to helping the family scope in the times that we are living in. So fundamentally, in the way we deploy media, it's a reflection of society as well, right? Because you are fundamentally in the business of generating revenue. You are targeting your shoppers, you are targeting your consumers, and most of all, you want to influence the household. So let me take the example today of brands like Harpic, brands like Lysol. Today, the purchase decision is no longer being made only by the woman. The husband has a big role to play because it's finally about the health and well-being of the whole family. So I think to your first question, Rajiv, is the gender role from targeting stand standpoint getting reframed? The short answer is absolutely. And we actually started doing that about two years ago, not just in the way we were depicting the conversation or the narrative in our advertising, where today the new ad that would be breaking now for Heartpick in like the next week, you would actually be able to see where the protagonist is not only trying to influence the homemaker, he's also influ influencing the guy in the house. Because the decision for how to protect your family perhaps belongs to the whole family, right? And I think in media targeting as well, especially when we talk about rural India, there again, the gender divide completely breaks because your mobile phone is perhaps registered in the name of the man, but still it's a shared device in a lot of cases. So when you target as well, a lot of times women are not the shoppers, but they're only the influencers. So in that context, again, advertising is again targeted to both men and women. If you really have to get the families to adopt superior hygiene. So to your question, I think Rajiv, today digital allows you to be even more focused in television country, which is a country where there's still one television set for the whole family. It's typically a 21 inch TV, which is shared by a family of five. If we were to look at just averages, but mobile is a personal consumption device. So allows you to create a much more personalized narrative. And I think that's where there's an exciting opportunity for all of us as marketers. And over to you. Fantastic. I think that, that uh, the narrative for uh, coming months and years and uh, very, very encouraging to see uh, that a company like yourself is already expanding. Uh, so one is in terms of roles and second in terms of targeting. Great. So Anusha, to you, uh, you come from a very rich background. Uh, share your opinion on how you see things right now and how do you see things changing in the future? Anusha, you're on mute. Sorry, sorry about that. Uh, thanks, Rajiv. I actually love what Sukleen said. But what I'm going to do is try and see if I can take this question slightly differently, OK? Um, you know, this, me, I mean, I, I come from the digital world, and I've been part of the advertising world, too. Uh, so I'm able to see it from a media and a fragmented value perspective that digital gives us, uh, and also see it from the holistic brand perspective that, you know, uh, uh, agencies are part of. I think the first thing I want to kind of say is that honestly, while digital has happened in all our lives, principles of brand building haven't changed. Uh, you know, whether we go OTT in media or we go digital in media, brand is a brand and the way marketers look at the principles of brand building hasn't really changed much. And that's an evolved field, right? Now, choosing your target audience is actually part of this decision making, right? Uh, I'll take an example of one of my clients, for example, uh, a fitness gear, for example, is the product and uh, yeah, and professional, you know, marathoners, swimmers, runners is really the core target audience on this whole thing. Now, it's a choice we've made to go after people who are now I can broad base this target audience and actually say that, you know, I can also look at people who are not necessarily professionals, but want to be professionals and I can broad base this, or I can decide as a brand based on many considerations saying, no, I want to go niche and I want to close in on this professional community. Now, there are many things that go into making these decisions. Budget could be one of the biggest decisions on how I manage this whole thing. The point I'm trying to make really is that its principles of brands haven't really changed, whether it is OTT or digital. I still choose this world really well. But having chosen it, for example, let's say, 
uh, I've decided that professional runners are my community and that's the person I want to focus on. The beauty of today's digital media is it allows me to actually target them in multiple different ways. For example, let's assume I have a birthday coming up of a fitness gear person, right? And I could have a set of people whose birthdays are coming up. And we know gifts play a very big role on birthdays. And I can decide to target the woman who's married to this man and try and see if I can target communication across birthdays and gifting and the right choice being fitness gears because this man is a fitness. Now, I can use this model and distribute it in many, many, many different ways within the target. I'm not seeing uh, gender bias as an issue. I'm seeing opportunities uh, to reach the consumer in many, many effective and efficient ways. Right. However, decision on whether you want to target a man, you want to target a woman is part of a larger discussion of who your target audience is and where do you see your base uh, for business. Right. There are many things that go into it. So I hope I said it. Let me just summarize. I'm just saying I'm not seeing gender bias as a big issue. I think principles of brand building remain the same. You make choices on who your target audience is. Once you decide this, I genuinely believe there are hundreds of ways to reach this communication and ensure that it delivers in a very impactful manner to be able to do as results. Fantastic. Anisha, thanks for, for your uh, insightful uh, uh, thought on that. Uh, so basically, I will now move on to Sujit and ask you, now, when FMCGs plan, they look at target audience at their first uh, level, then they define the markets and then they go about various things in terms of building communication, in terms of reaching out. When it comes to banking, BFSI as a sector, how are you looking at it? Do you look at demographics or do you look at life beyond demographics? Hi, Rajiv. Good afternoon and good afternoon to all my co-panelists. Uh, it's, I think, a pretty interesting and lively discussion. You already have got two very interesting perspectives. I'll try to bring the banking perspective and I'll also hear Akash's views on that because he's also from the same sector. Um, so Rajiv, to answer your question, we or in our bank, we look at it from two broad categories, two broad points of view. The first will be direct uh, acquisition led advertising and the second I will come into, which is brand building. Acquisition led advertising is something that is, I would say, recent. Um, it has it has seen life from the time the digital medium has come on. And what is it? It is simply means that if you're looking for a home loan and if you like my offer, I bring you to my website. I show you my details. And if you like, we close the deal or at least we close half the deal on the website. And from there, we take it ahead. So this is direct ROI led. This is not based on demographics or age. This is based on interests. And this is based on timing. For example, uh, if I know you're a foreign traveler uh, and if I'm able to reach out to you at the time you're planning a foreign travel with my Forex card, it is of relevance to you. But if I know you're a foreign traveler and if I reach out to you in the, in the month of September when it is in normal years, not this year, but in normal years, you can't take a leave in September because of the school season, then I'm wasting my money. So essentially, if I'm able to reach out to the right person in the right manner at the right time, I will be able to get the right ROI for my business. Some time back, I was giving an example of home loans. We all home loans once in seven years, eight years, 10 years, which means at any point in time, people of the age group of 30 to 50 living in urban areas of this age group, any point in time, max 10 or 15 percent people will be looking at a home loan. Right. So if I go and bombard the entire country with my home loan ad, then 80% of the people don't need it at that point in time. So why do I do it? Why should I do it? I should not. That's wasting of money. But at the same time, if I get intelligent signals from digital, and there are pretty good ways of getting such signals now, if I pick up those signals and reach out only to those people, my ROIs are going to be far higher. So interestingly, that for a lot of banks, including us, uh, acquisition through digital is actually uh, is, is, is a channel by itself. Uh, we might not because of various rules we might not be able to close the entire acquisition on digital because we need to, in some category we need to meet the customer there are some rules and regulations around it but at least getting the interested person on the side getting a lead get doing an eligibility check checking his income checking his video scores and taking it to a half eligible lead from where it can be handed over to the sales team that is a process that is pretty well established in the banking industry and that is what i call as direct acquisition that advertising 
Uh, we also do brand building advertising, the typical or uh, the FMCG or the other categories way, which is also done. And I'll give an example of that. Um, so, so last year we launched uh, the first mobile app for SMEs in the country. It was a bank. It was an app meant for businesses. We all use mobile banking apps for our individual purposes, but the first app in the industry for SMEs was launched last year. Now, one of the reasons we went and we broke a large campaign on TV purpose was also to build the digital quotient of ICICI Bank because one of the key drivers of brand consideration in banking is technology. So we did that ad on TV to the uh, to the top metros, top 10, 12, 15 cities, and we spoke about our digital content. You're right, there would have been a lot of spillover, but we were fine with the fact that the spillover was building the digital con uh, quotient, the digital quotient of ICICI Bank among the others. But what we did was interesting, along with the brand building ad, we said that because this is an app for SMEs, how on digital can I reach out to SMEs in the most effective way? And even if they are not my customers, can I break them, bring them into my fold, open a current account through them digitally, and then tell them to download the app? So it was a great example of building brand, building trust, building awareness, building consideration, and along with that, using TV plus digital to build business also. So I think there is a uh, short of uh, if I give a short summarized answer of this, uh, thanks to the media and thanks to multiple ways of reading customers, uh, planning has become far more evolved than what it was uh, uh, 25 years back when you spoke about that example. Uh, planning has become far more evolved and at least in banking, you can use it depending on the purpose for which your advertisement is being there. It need not be one straight jacketed approach for everything. I hope that answers. No, no, absolutely. That gives a completely different perspective uh, to the subject itself. So you are not bothered about uh, demographics. You are bothered about the interest and intent of a customer. I think that's a right. that's very interesting. I, I'm sorry. I'll, I'm sorry. I'll take one last sentence. We are actually going to intent also. Let me give an example. Um, lots of people might be keen on taking a loan, but as you know, for taking taking a loan, we also need to look at eligibility. Not everybody will be eligible for a loan. So we are now actually able to marry interest and eligibility also on digital so that I know the person whom I'm bringing to my site, I have the highest possible ROI. Not only is he interested, but I also know he's eligible to take a loan. So we're actually trying to go beyond the level beyond interest also. So sorry, so, I just cut you. Great. No, no, thanks. Thanks a lot. Akash, over to you. Let's hear from your side. Uh, you must be having some global learnings as well, DBS being a bank uh, which is beyond India. We would like to hear from you perspective on this the subject of demographics interest. Uh, so, Rajiv, uh, you know, one after Sujit has probably given a summary of, of the thesis of marketing and banking, it's very difficult to add. But let me add a slightly different perspective and largely because, uh, you know, in my previous life, I used to work for FMCG, right? See, I think one part which Sujit very nicely said is about making sure you are taking care of all the consumers who are at the lower end of the funnel. I mean, that's definitely, I mean, key ask why, because it drives results very easily, very quickly, very visibly. Right? Um, and I think the, the, the challenge in my mind is in the spirit of trying to broad base, uh, you know, the banking sector kind of, kind of doesn't, uh, you know, positively operate on the area of identifying a segment which you believe you're more tuned towards, right? And, you know, obviously, uh, you know, with, with the scale that Sujit has, it's for him, it's, it's, it's about looking at the entire base. But for a growth bank like ours, we're very focused in saying, which is the audience that I want to delight with my products, my services, and my uh, marketing and communication, right? That becomes extremely critical to me because the belief is that the more that I delight this audience, the, they will always over index on how they generate revenue for me, right? See, otherwise, um, you know, casting your fish uh, net wide and saying, I'm going to go after everyone and anyone for numbers that looks good might give you an initial uh, bump in your returns as well. But then over a period of time, you want to stick to the people who deliver maximum results, right? That's point number one. And, you know, I just want to extend that. And uh, I love what Anusha said, right? The choice for every brand, right? The brand has to mean and stand to the stand for something to the target audience, right? And you know, even the example that you took of the sort of India's largest noodle brand and having worked on that brand, the choice always was if I have a finite budget, and Anusha mentioned that, which is the audience that I'll go after first? 
And this is the audience where I believe the returns will be over indexed, right? So I think that's the choice that marketers, I mean, whether it's FMCG or banking, we have to make consistently in saying, where am I getting maximum returns out of my money? Uh, yes, for banking, lower funnel, extremely critical, but even on, on, on you know, areas of choosing a, a brand positioning or a messaging, the question is, who's the audience which is going to give you maximum returns? I think that uh, gives a very clear perspective. You have, in, in fact, sliced the audience further. You're saying uh, that let's go behind uh, not only people who have an intent interest, but uh, also that make long-term commercial sense in terms of giving them customer delight. And that delight can only happen if it's a it's a true give and take. Let's move over to Nipun. Let's hear uh, you out, Nipun. What's your experience? Uh, how do you guys look at, uh, uh, at at audiences in terms of demographics? How do you plan media? Okay, sure. So, hello everybody, uh, and uh, it's uh, it's a delight uh, to be amongst uh, all of you today. Uh, see, for Vivo and our category, uh, unlike a lot of other categories, uh, where sometimes the decision making is more impulse. Uh, because the ticket size is usually say 50 rupees, 100 rupees, 200 rupees. Uh, in our case, uh, the minimum ticket size uh, for a brand like Vivo uh, is seven and seven, eight thousand rupees uh, and goes up to 50,000 rupees. So when uh, the and the latest product we launched uh, is close to 50,000 rupees. So when the when the price point is so high uh, and in a category like mobile phone, uh, what we've seen is that the audience is highly, highly involved. Uh, very well aware uh, about uh, what features they want, what price they want, what are their priorities. People do a lot of research uh, before they will really go out there and spend whatever money they have decided to spend. And somebody who has lesser money will, of course, uh, still spend, say, 10, 12,000, 15,000 rupees. And somebody who really wants to push it can even spend up to 50,000 rupees. So mobile phone purchase is a highly involved purchase. Uh, the decision-making cycle, uh, also is somewhere between uh, 30 to 45 days on an average. And with that kind of decision-making cycle, whenever we plan our media, whether it is digital, influencer campaigns, uh, television, print, uh, outdoor, you know, we, we also keep in mind uh, multiple aspects, uh, starting from uh, when the customer will actually start thinking about uh, a phone uh, change uh, to, so pre-purchase to purchase, uh, is is uh, is very important. Uh, then the other thing is uh, also about trade, uh, because uh, Vivo, you know, we primarily focus uh, on offline, uh, and that's where bulk of our uh, sales come from. Uh, so in our case, the moment there is say a new launch uh, and there is a there is a heavy campaign on on television on digital, then automatically the interest and the confidence of the trade also boosts. Uh, and that also helps in in the overall uh, in the overall scheme of things. Uh, so uh, so these are the two parts which I wanted to share with you when we start thinking about our planning, which is a longer life cycle uh, and more uh, involved purchase and educated uh, audience. Uh, at least in, when it comes to mobile phone, they do a lot of research. Uh, and lastly, uh, confidence booster for the trade as well. Sure, great. Uh, I think that builds a very good perspective from a from a uh, very good uh, uh, set of panelists uh, that we have. Now, this actually forces us to think in a direction that let's look at the businesses that were built around hundred years back. FMCGs, uh, FMCG as a category is is the grandfather of advertising. Every single principle is actually coming out of the house of HUL, PNG, Reckitt. GCPL kind of companies. Uh, if you look at the businesses that have shaped up or scaled up in last 20, 25 years, the way they look at media is very different. Uh, this we all understand uh, that uh, maybe there's a kind of a traditional approach and there is a kind of a postmodernist approach. The question is why? So, so my question is to uh, to uh, to Suklin saying that. How do you look at the impact of advertising? Is it because of the outcome that uh, you look at differently? Today, a mobile phone brand looks at an immediate return on investment. Banking looks at a very heavy performance. Whereas, because they're all operating either at channel or bottom funnel, kind of more towards bottom funnel kind of 
whereas FCC of the category is largely operating at top of the funnel. Awareness generation and a typical flow from awareness to consumption. So please share with us, is that the reason or what are the reasons why you look at it media differently and then you move on to other families uh, on how they measure their ROI. So Sukleen, to specify the question, how do you measure ROI? Is it only off-take or are there other parameters? I think fundamentally the role of advertising is to generate sale. So off-take definitely is one of the most important metrics which you look at, at least as far as your modeling is concerned, right? So even when we look at any kind of modeling tools that we may use, whether it's a Nielsen, MMX, or any methodology that we may deploy where you're comparing multiple medias, ROI, of course, then is directly derived from the off -takes. Having said that, when you do look at online, CTR today is the holy grail of intent, right? So even one of the metrics that we also look at extremely closely, whether you are executing content on statics or across other media, what's the stated intent? Is your CTR improving? And then today in terms of attribution, there are multiple ways in which you can look at full funnel closure, where you can actually see, see with e-commerce becoming much more substantive and even on brands, Rajiv, where today between e commerce and modern trade, where, the, where there is enough consumer base, right? Like today, when you partner with a with someone like Reliance Geo, they have presence both in online and off offline. When you partner with a customer like Amazon, again, they have a substantive presence online and they are also now trying to create a base offline. So there is clearly intent that becomes extremely vital for us to measure. And where the holy grail clearly is the CTR that you look at and say, all right, is the needle moving? Of course, we can do brand left studies to see if awareness was met, if intent was shown, but ultimately you are going to be keen to see transaction. That's one thing which broad-based media is not able to give you. But when it comes to comparing between media, then a multimedia research, which is like MMX, is still very helpful to look at what kind of ROIs are we generating. So when you look at TV and with digital TV, which is OTT platforms, What's your yardstick on, on TV? Is it an OTT or do you look at a common yardstick? Is it the same brand lift study you apply on both? Is it like TV drives buzz and TV drives my offtake? Digital, I don't know what it does right now. So where, where do you exactly stand on position vis-a-vis -vis TV versus uh, uh, digital or video? I think the biggest difference is, Rajiv, today marketers don't have the luxury of saying one versus the other. I think that conversation is a really old conversation. Frankly, on this table as well, I would say this is many, many years ago. Like today, you have to also recognize we will be choosing media in line with where our consumers is. So the word is really complementarity and and, right? Because we are all multimedia consumers. Every single person is hooked on to more than one medium. I think the real question to answer is what is the job of every medium? Right. So are you seeking incremental reach? Are you seeking increased frequency? Are you trying to build engagement? I think the number one question a marketer needs to answer is how do I think in complementarity where I'm able to create a seamless relationship for a consumer, which is between a large screen and the multiple screens that he's interacting with. Right. So I think that's really the first part of it. Second part of it, which is extremely critical is how do I even distribute, right? When media's role is to generate offtake, but people often underestimate the role of channel, right? The reason why today digital is actually proving to be extremely efficacious in DFSI, in luxury, in e-com, it's also because of the transaction loop, right? But if your transaction is actually going to happen in deep trade or in rural or in lower income India, then you also have to make sure that your media strategy tailors to that. But I think the operative word again is complementarity, right? If you target a market like UP today, which still is media dark, how can you operate a plan which does not have mobile as the first port of call along with television, right? So I think somewhere for marketers, extremely critical to think in complementarity. And second, when we look at MMX, the yardstick you will apply is what are your drivers of offtake? How do you actually grow offtake? So when you are building categories, not market share battles, but pure categories, all of penetration actually happens when you increase retail footprint. How do you increase retail footprint? It's completely correlated with advertising footprint. So therefore you have to apply the yardstick, which is right for those brands. 
keeping the channel in mind. Yeah. Sure, sure. No, that's that's good. Anusha, I uh, would like to hear your view on uh, the subject of uh, how do you measure success and uh, what has been your experience of working with brands. Uh, is I haven't come across any BLS. I'm, I mean, I'm saying on a public forum, but I have never come across any BLS that doesn't show a lift. So is that enough? Uh, are there other ways to look at life? Are you are, are people questioning that, saying that uh, offtake is too delayed because purchase decisions, like uh, so clean said, is dependent on availability on on various other things. You and and the cycle is is need based. I mean, I need to run out of a product at my house. Uh, for me to go and pick it up or order. So now in that kind of a scenario, how should FMCG as a category, which again goes through this, there's a difference between like uh, Sukleen highlighted between an e-commerce oriented approach, a home delivery oriented approach versus an FMCG where the cycle is very different and it's, it's trade led. What do you feel or what is your experience on how marketers are revisiting and how are they planning to look at future? You're on, you're on mute, Anusha. I'm doing this again and again. <laughs> so actually, so clean answered this question really well. Um, let me try and see if I can add to it, uh, uh, right? Um, see, no amount of work can be justified in advertising or digital or anywhere in the world if it does not make the brand win. And when you make the brand win, it is obvious if sales does not take off, right? And it doesn't convert for the brand. No amount of work can be justified in any which way. Logic tells you if the work is right, relevant, delivered at the right time, at the right place, in the right way, it should result in, uh, you know, ROI. The final ROI, whatever we say, is really in the brand converting into sales, right? It's very clear that's the space that we need to operate in. Now, obviously, life is not as easy to measure A is equal to B, right? There are multiple other metrics and, and ROI measurement scales which lead us to this uh, behavior. So uh, every platform has a role. Like uh, Supreme said, if we know, for example, exactly what TV is going to deliver for us and what digital is going to deliver for us, if we, you know, very often, uh, a lot of us just go into the digital world and say, I'm doing this on TV. Digital is a necessary thing today. I cannot ignore it. So I'm going to do something, which means I will just put that ad on digital and create a little bit of incremental reach. So I'm not able to confidently look back at this platform and medium and say, what result or ROI it gave me, right? I'm clearly able to see I spent a lot more money on TV and it definitely showed sales increase that in the next quarter. So I know something happened here, but I'm not able to put my, you know, my pulse and say, what did digital actually? And, and which is really where we all need to be extremely careful. I, you know, while di digital is a very, very default platform today, there is no logic and we don't need to debate it. But I think each one of us should question what we are trying to achieve on digital. If you're able to put that, you know, for example, a larger objective could sit on TV, no problem. As long as we're able to put a specific objective and measure that objective, you will not be able to connect the dots back to sales and figure out whether it's working for you or not working for you. Again, like Supreme said, you follow your consumer. If your consumer is on digital, you're on, on digital. If your consumer is a, uh, you know, a, a retail market, which is not on digital and more heavily on TV, obviously you'll follow them there. While all that is right, I'm only saying that if we want to get a feel for ROI and what is actually causing that sales, we need yep. to be able to specify those objectives extremely well. One of the things that we recently did uh, for Procter & Gamble in China is really put all the KPIs, immediate KPIs and metrics of ROI. For example, it could be social gaming, this kind of a sentiment, this kind of a positive sentiment, uh, this kind of a reach, you know, whatever those numbers that we put together. Or, you know, through TV, I'm able to get this kind of GRP, IMRB data tells me these are my brand scores. Uh, media data tells me this is the kind of spends in various markets. So I have tons of input uh, data and I have tons of KPIs and measurement and ROIs that have come out of those objectives. This platform that we built for PNG actually allows us to play with this data 
and see what combinations of these could have probably given us that result, right? This simulation exercise is something that all of us as marketers need to start doing because unless we get clarity in this diversity, we are not going to be able to specifically answer this question and say, yes, I know that this is a platform that gave me results or this platform didn't give me results. Uh, I think it's very important to be clear on what we want to achieve and measure it in the right way. Of course, the final measurement is nothing but sales. Uh, but we need to be able to connect the smaller measurement criteria into the, those dots. Really. And we need to make an effort in that place to do it scientifically and feel confident about it. No, great, Anusha. I think you know you have touched upon the I'll not say million dollar, but the billion dollar question, which everybody needs to answer. And the question is, are we answering? Which is multi-touch attribution. Now, uh, digital uh, native brands and digital native companies are actually working extensively on solving this puzzle of uh, attribution, to be very frank. So today, uh, e-commerce companies or uh, any sort of digital companies or digital oriented companies or digital native companies, the biggest challenge in life is attribution. Right now, they're going with a last touch kind of an attribution, but they're working. So there's discussion on soon it'll reach somewhere. But when it comes to uh, the traditional categories or large categories, like again, CPG, I will, I'll call it as because they reach every single rural area, urban area. I just feel a little bit of disconnect on the part of trying to figure out the attribution model. Why I say that is today, the amount of time spent and the number of people that are available on digital platform that skew towards digital platform is not reflected in the investment strategies as of now, that's the only yeah, that's observation. That's ideally, true. Yeah, ideally the money needs to move and it'll only move only when you know what to expect, hence the attribution part. I think attribution has, has been solved a lot by the category handled by Sujit and Akash and even Nipun. So I would now straight away jump to Sujit. I just want to Rajiv, just add to what you're saying, which is, you know, I was just looking at data that had come in in the last week, which is really in spite of feeling this obvious uh, growth in the digital space, right? I mean, we're part of OTT and we've all seen the kind of numbers that we're associated with. The 2021 forecast is that 30% of marketing budgets uh, or advertising budgets is going on digital while 70% is still there. And that literally answers it. We are seeing it, uh, it's happening, but we're not seeing that reflected investments as of now. Uh, and I guess that will change only when the confidence uh, really change, changes, right? We need to uh, uh, get there. And I'm sure the jump will be obvious after that. Sure, sure. So Sujit, over to you. Share the attribution model and then Akash, over after that to you on the attribution model that you apply. How do you justify your expenditure? And to begin with, if you can broadly specify, what's your split between traditional and digital terms of expenditure? So Rajiv, uh, <clears throat> I'll answer this question directly and I want to touch something else also because it's an IEMI forum and I want to bring up something that's very close to my heart. So first is your direct question on attribution model. Uh, tried it a number of times and I have no shame in saying I've given up because when I total up my attribution models uh, without taking any of the names of the media or the platforms, the sum of what I get is more than 2x of what I actually receive. I'm saying if I total up every attribution model, every channel, and every attribution model says Ki, as per last touch, you got x from my channel, but Attribution model will say you got 1.6. So if I start totaling up all attribution models, I'm at a loss because the total of attribution models is more than double of what I actually got. And this has been despite everybody coming and saying we have the best AI, best ML, best all of this. For whatever reason it has worked, maybe it's our fault, but I've not been able to see attribution models work. Therefore, to go back to uh, my philosophy is that be very clear about what works and what doesn't work. And I want to bring in a very different example here that none of us have uh, spoken about. We all use it, but we have not spoken about. Uh, and I want to bring it that as an example to say how marketers really, really choose, I think, the right medium. Uh, so let's talk about print for a moment and how different categories there is banking here. There is uh, e-com, uh, people have spoken about e-com, though there's no representative. And there is uh, telecom also, and we are large users of print. The interesting bit 
For the last 10 years, people all across the globe are saying, uh, you know, normal predictions about print. I don't want to say that here, but people are talking about the normal predictions about print. Uh, but print advertising, if you take a 10-year CAGR, has been doing well. I don't want to talk about the last one or two years, but print advertising 10-year CAGR has been doing okay. Now, what is the reason for it? Now, let me take a big example. Every year, starting from July, August till Diwali, is the biggest sales season for e-com and e -com and for others, right? So, on a Navratri period or on a Diwali day, if you want to reach out to 10 crore users with the offer of the week, the largest e-com platforms, the largest banks, because we have a credit card offers, the largest phone brands, uh, the smartest, the easiest way for you to build reach, because your offers don't stay for two months, you, your offers stay for a week, and you want maximum traction on the offer, everybody goes and spends a huge amount of money on print. The reason I'm bringing this example is that willy-nilly, I think, marketeers and agencies across sectors uh, in a lot of categories or in most categories, they're able to find out what works. You might not exactly have a multivariate regression model with an R square of 0.7 and all that, but you know what works and when you put to five crores, what brings you sales the next day. So essentially, Rajiv, what I'm trying to say is it's very important to know what works for you. In some categories, you might be able to be fortunate to have a multivariate regression model, a strong regression model that tells you what works. In some categories, the regression model might not be there. Like, I have not been able to arrive at one. But you should at least know uh, through trial and error what media works for you, what messaging works for you. That's point number one. Point number two, I want to completely change stack with your permission and apologies. I didn't discuss this with you earlier. But that is a question of time spent. We're all discussing time spent. And I'm bringing this up, hoping that if somebody is in IMEI is hearing, then maybe we can do something about it. It's a problem that I tried to tackle since the last 18 months. Uh, yeah, okay, I'll keep it short. Absolutely, I'll finish in 60 seconds. I've got a message from the host saying keep it short. So last 18 months, I've been trying to understand what is time spent for my core TG. Males 30 to 50, working adults, not only males, all working adults 30 to 50, staying in top 15, 20 towns. What's time spent? If I total up the IRS data and if I total up the various data that comes on digital, Rajiv, my problem is even pre-COVID, when people used to go to office, the average time spent on all media, TV, print, OTT, digital, social media, all put together is more than eight hours a day. Now, this means that if you're working eight and a half a day, we're commuting two hours a day, we're eating one and a half hours a day, and we are on social media and all sorts of media, not social media, all sorts of media for eight and hours a day, then we don't have time to sleep. Or we are sleeping and eating and but not working in office, we're only consuming media. It's ridiculous, it's impossible. So I think I would urge this, and I've said this in various other fora also, if the people who are in charge of measurements, can we get a reliable cross-category, cross-channel, cross-media measurement platform that can bring in a lot of science and a lot of clarity to agencies and marketers? It's, I think, the biggest cry need of the day, without which a lot of us are hunting in the dark, and then we are using our own internal tools of kya kiya hamne and kya karne se what awareness went up, what consideration went up, and what sales went up. But all those are a lot of bit of models, bit of guesswork. I think we desperately need a cross category, cross medium, common measurement platform. So I want to speak much more on it, but because of the time very time valid time extremely valid job. I think everything we're talking about accountability and measurability, it should not be left to imagination. Akash, very quickly over to you. Yeah, I'll say quickly. Uh, attribution model, I agree with Sujit. Attribution model, I figured out, is a way for a platform owner to prove that they're still valid, they're still relevant, right? And uh, uh, the bias in creating the model actually impacts the outcome. You look at any model, in the in even, I, I've done pilots where we've run two models together. The results are very different despite us focusing on the same inputs, same assumptions, and so on and so forth. That's point number one. Point number two, I just want to quickly comment on the point that Sujit said. You know, Sujit, I, I personally believe uh, while you know this this ask for a cross platform measurement uh, you know either a body and you know or a platform has been around for the last i don't know 10 years since we've been talking digital uh, and i mean the the challenge always is none of the big guys would want to share the data across because that's what gives them power and that's what uh, you know makes uh, makes it difficult for us as marketers to make the right decisions however there's a positive to that as well right so therefore um, you know the 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 going forward point i believe 
will be for, as Sujit said, for us to start building our own data and our own learnings, which will drive competitive advantage, right? Otherwise, you know, the challenge will be if, if, if it becomes a standardized platform available to everyone, then, uh, you know, Sujit's marketing approach and my marketing approach will be very similar, right? And we'll probably be competing with each other at all points of time. Whereas today, given his learning and his experience and so on and so forth, his approach is very different to my, my to mine, right? And then, you know, I'm, I'm hoping we're, we're driving business um, as the objective has been so that's the point, and I'll, I'll give it back to you, Rajiv. So that, that builds in uh, uh, additional perspective. I think it's very exciting to see uh, two sides of the uh, the spectrum. Uh, very quickly to Nipun to you, and 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 then we'll we'll have to wrap this up. Uh, so so over to you, Nipun. What's your understanding on the attribution model, and what's your take on it? Okay. <laughs> see, uh, we uh, we at Vivo uh, like to keep it uh, slightly simple. Uh, and uh, the way uh, we like to uh, do it is we will first look at uh, you know what is the role of TV and then digital. Uh, and in our mind, uh, the role also depends on what campaign we are going to run. Uh, if it's a larger brand campaign uh, where so the content is a two minute, three minute format and it's not directly a new product launch, it's not an NPL. So then the then the approach uh, will be much more digital skewed because the goal is also more engagement uh, with the brand and other things uh, at the same time uh, there are uh, at most times usually there is NPL uh, which we get into and where then TV plays uh, again the most important medium as far as the reach is concerned but that's not where it finishes as I was sharing earlier as well uh, in our category consumer will like to research even more understand even more details about what the product is all about uh, so therefore while TV can be a very good awareness medium uh, digital starts uh, build, uh, converting that awareness into uh, consideration and finally preference. Uh, and so therefore the lower uh, lower funnel part uh, or the responsibility of the lower funnel lies more on digital, whereas uh, the upper funnel, the top funnel uh, lies with TV in our case. Fantastic. I think uh, it's, uh, do we have more time to the host? Uh, no, I am extremely sorry, oh. Mr. So, yeah, no, sure. So let me just wrap it up. So basically, we had a fantastic discussion. I think this discussion calls for a full day of workshop rather than uh, just half an hour or 40 minutes. And uh, extremely excited to chat with each one of you. And I promise you that we'll have a, a offline conversation as well, uh, because there's a lot to learn from each other. Look at it that one category, which is uh, right now pumping in 10% to 15% of their budgets on digital and looking into digital to, to come up to 40 to 50%. I'm talking about FMCG, CPG as a category. Uh, now their problem set or their consideration set is very different. You look at a category that's already spending 40, 50% of their monies on, on digital, and they're talking about attribution model being all over the place and not bringing in most of the data. So not neither the attribution is correct, nor the time spent on media is correct, which is I'm completely with, you, uh, which only means two things. One, measurement has the quality of measurement uh, and analytics has to improve. B, we need to have a lot of discussions of these sorts and bring in, uh, our category insights onto the table because what you've learned could be a learning for other categories as well. So thanks a lot for your time.